So that's why Johnson was there. So we went over there and uh, I got a glass of wine and over by the fireplace, the vice president was sitting and he uh, was drinking decaf coffee. No wine, just decaf coffee. One cup after another. Finish a cup, put it down, get another cup, decaf coffee. So always smoozing big ups with big shots and whatever, I walked over and sat down in an overstuffed chair next to his overstuffed chair. And I said, Mr. Vice President, what is going to be the fate of Kennedy's civil rights legislation that he's trying to get passed? And what was going on was the uh, civil rights legislation had been introduced. It was going nowhere in the Congress. Nowhere. Richard Russell uh, of Georgia had absolutely blocked it, and it was dead on the right. So I said, uh, is that going to get loose or not? Well, I could, he paused for a minute, and I could tell he was trying to decide whether or not I was worth an explanation. <laughs> and <clears throat> finally decided in my favor, so he said, uh, welcome, let me tell you a story. He said, in 1960, when we were campaigning for vice president and president, we were driving through New, Me New Mexico. And you know how New Mexico is. You drive for an hour and there's nothing but cactus. And then you come across a service station. And you stop and get a coat and go to the bathroom said, so we had an entourage of about six cars in the vice presidential campaign. And we pulled into this gas station, and everybody got out, went inside, went to the bathroom, got a coat, and went home. And <clears throat> we got ready to leave, and there was a girl missing. He said, welcome. We looked everywhere in that service station to find this girl and could not find her said she was a staffer in the majority leader's office. And we were couldn't figure it out to save our neck. And he said, it turned out she was a block behind the building, squatting down behind a bush, because they would not let her use the bathroom because she was black. Oh. And Johnson he grabbed me on the knee and he leaned over and he stuck his finger in my face and he said, welcome, that is wrong, that's wrong. And when I can do something about that, I'm going to. Six months later, he was President of the United States. Six months after that, he passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And <clears throat> for that, I think we should all be very grateful. All right, our time is about up here. Yes, sir, Pat? Uh, I, I rate Johnson uh, as one of the great presidents that we have because not just what he did there, but what he did for our state. How do you rate him? Well, I think Johnson was is probably the lo most underrated president, all because of the Vietnam War, for which I blame Robert McNamara. Not McNamara. I knew McNamara slightly. Uh, but he was the one that kept going in there to the president and saying, all we need is another six months and another gazillion troops and whatever, and we'll win this war. Uh, but anyway, so that was Johnson's big thing. But when you consider Medicare, uh, when you consider the Civil Rights Act, when you consider the major uh, earth-changing legislation that he got passed, and by the way, he was very conservative. He was from the conservative wing of the Democratic Party when there were no Republicans. We had seven Republicans in Texas in those days, and uh, they, no, they were never elected anything. But we had two parties within the Democratic Party, and Johnson was head of the conservative. He used to go around in the White House cutting off the lights to save electricity. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Out of all the things that you've seen and done, what would you? Describe as the one defining moment for your life that you look back on? Well, this may sound politically correct, but
but it's when I married my college sweetheart in 1949. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the, uh, in those days, we had a 44-hour week. Everybody worked on Saturday. Well, I never got out of that habit. I still work on Saturday, six or seven hours on Saturday. On Sunday, I work out of my briefcase at home. So I spent my life as a workaholic, and my wife was put up with it. And uh, you know, so we have five kids, 16 grandkids, etc. She's an accomplished artist, uh, but she has made a, a big difference uh, with me. Let me mention one other thing. When we married, she was Catholic. So I decided that I would become a Catholic. And, uh, and because I had studied the Catholic Church and I was favorably inclined and so forth. Well, my mother came unglued. <laughs> Not because of hatred for the Catholic Church. She came unglued because if I became a Catholic, I could never be President of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the way mothers thought it was. That's the way they thought. Really, she was so disappointed because that meant I would never be president of the United States, but she was certain I was going to be. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you kindly. Let me, uh, how many people here know Dr. Red Duke? <laughs> Red is a, uh, an old man, although he's younger than I by a couple of years. So I bumped into him at the country club the other day, and we got to talking about old age. And he said, welcome. You know you're getting old when you tell your best friend that you're having an affair. And he wants to know who's catering it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Welcome. I know I enjoyed your story just as everyone else did. Thank you so much. Thank you again for thank you again to Brookville Park.